Good evening, everyone. Hello, I'm Jack Titchener, the Interim Director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at SIU Carbondale. It's a distinct honor and a privilege tonight to welcome you here as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Paul Simon Institute. We've had a wonderful year this year, taking stock of the, institution, the Institute's many accomplishments over the past two decades as we look ahead to new challenges and opportunities. Before we start the formal part of this evening's event, I want to recognize some honored guests in the audience tonight. Our new chancellor, SIU Carbondale Chancellor, Carlo Montemagno. <laughs> Senator Simon's daughter, Sheila Simon, is here, along with her husband, Perry Canope. <laughs> I want to recognize three individuals who played some key roles in the founding of the Simon Institute. The Institute's uh, visiting professor, Dr. John Jackson and Dr. Joe Foote. <laughs> Dr. Foote, of course, was the first dean of our College of Mass Communication and Media Arts at SIU. And uh, he and Dr. Jackson wrote the Notice of New and Expanded Program Request, that's the formal paperwork, that actually created the Institute and steered it through the internal review process here on campus. Uh, Dr. Foote was not able to join us tonight. He was planning on being here, but the bad weather and uh, forced some flight cancellations so they could not join us. Uh, he and Jody send their best wishes to uh, everyone for tonight's event, and they look forward to uh, the time when they can be back amongst friends here in Carbondale. Former SIU Vice President for Academic Affairs, John Haller, is with us tonight. Dr. Haller was critical in shepherding the Institute's formal request through the approval process with the Illinois Board of Higher Education and ultimately the uh, governor's office. Judge Richard Brown and his son Nate are here tonight. Barb Brown, of course, was an early supporter of the Institute's work, and we're very happy to announce tonight that the Springfield Internship Program that bears her name is being relaunched this spring by the Department of Political Science. We're also joined tonight by Carbondale Mayor, Mike Henry. And State Representative Dave Severn of Benton. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the President of the Southern Illinois University System, Dr. Randy Dunn. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate that. Good evening, everyone. It's so wonderful to see this crowd that's gathered here at the law school tonight and uh, so many friends and familiar faces and it's just wonderful to have an opportunity for fellowship at the reception prior and I know you're all excited about what we're going to hear from Senator Durbin tonight. I've had the opportunity, the good fortune three or four times to introduce Senator Durbin at various events uh, at some place on uh, the, the SIU uh, campus, system, uh, across, campus across the system. and. Uh, each time I usually kind of forego uh, the, the, the formal biography and really spend a little bit of time telling uh, a couple of things uh, about Senator Durbin and his support for SIU. But because we have a number of students here tonight, possibly folks not from Illinois, I do want to take just a moment to mention the fact that Senator Durbin is in fact the senior senator for the state of Illinois, 47th senator in our state's history. If you're keeping count, Senator Tammy Duckworth is number 54. Um, 20 years ago, of course, Senator Durbin took the seat, coming uh, onto the seat from Senator Paul Simon. How appropriate we're here tonight uh, to have uh, Senator Durbin deliver remarks on the 20th anniversary. Obviously, um, Senator Durbin had come to the position after 14 years as a congressman. He was in the Springfield-based 20th Congressional District. Some of us, Senator, still wish we had 20 congressional districts in the state of Illinois. Obviously serves as Democratic whip in the U.S. Senate, has been in that role now for about a dozen years, was born in East St. Louis, Illinois, lives in Springfield. The point of all that is to say that Senator Durbin knows the footprint of the SIU system and he knows it extremely well. Now I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. 
if you, if you think about the lineage of Senator Durbin's seat, you can go back and look at names in the history of Illinois that are quite compelling. Some more recent than others, obviously. Beyond Senator Simon, Chuck Percy, Paul Douglas, David Davis, John A. Logan, and Stephen Douglas. Now I share that in looking at the lineage of that Senate seat to, to say this. And I guess I'm somewhat compelled to, to take a moment of personal privilege given all that we're watching unfold in the country right now. Senator Durbin, in carrying on the lineage of that seat, also is a statement, statesman. And if you look at the work he's done, and we follow this obviously particularly at SIU, providing leadership, in one case with Senator Warren, to look at how we monitor and oversee the for-profit higher education industry. Senator Durbin has been the leader. And every time we cross paths, he tells me the work that he's been doing on that. He may mention the fact that he had a chance to meet with a few DACA students tonight. And for all of those DACA students across the SIU system, we're looking to support them in every way we can. It's Senator Durbin who's been a co-sponsor on the Bridge Act to figure out a legislative solution for those dreamers. So we have in our midst a statesman, someone as we go 120 years from now, walks through that lineage, will have the name of Dick Durbin included in that list that I read tonight. Now but to shift gears a bit, every time that we've had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., which we try to do at least a couple of times a year to advance the various causes that we're working on here at SIU, whether it's something that's research-based or needing help from a federal agency, every time we try to make a stop and see Senator Durbin, as we do numerous members of the congressional delegation every time we visit D.C. And quite often, when we do those visits, we have an opportunity to sit with key staffers, individuals who are working on various projects for their member, who we can really talk to in, in some key ways about the issues we're dealing with at SIU and need help with in DC. When we make those visits, in addition to the great staff who the senator has working for him, we also see the senator sometimes in the Capitol office. And I know this holds true with the other state universities in Illinois. There's an openness, there's a willingness to hear, it out, hear us out. There's this advocacy role that the senator plays for higher education, not just in the state of Illinois nationally. And obviously, he's a tremendous friend of SIU. Senator, we're honored to have you back to celebrate the 20th anniversary to deliver the address tonight, Paul Simon Public Policy Inter Institute. So all of you gathered, give a great Saluki welcome to Senator Richard Durbin. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Randy. Randy, thanks for the kind introduction. Jack, thank you for your leadership. Uh, Sheila, wherever you are, where are you, Sheila? In the back row with Perry, glad you are here. Thank you so much. John Jackson, where are you? Somewhere there. We have spent a lot of time putting our heads together talking about Paul Simon and even political campaigns. Thank you for all that uh, you've meant to Paul and to me and to so many others. Randy says we ought to get back to the world of 20 congressional di uh, districts in Illinois. I'd love to see that myself. Uh, we had a unity uh, breakfast or brunch, I guess it was, in Springfield a few day, uh, weeks ago uh, for the Democrats, and a, a candidate showed up I'd never seen before. His name's, uh, I guess I had seen him. His name's Bob Marshall, and Bob's run, he's kind of an all-purpose candidate. He's running uh, as a libertarian, as a Republican. This time he decides he's going to run as a Democrat. And he uh, and he's a medical doctor, and he said, We'd been talking about unity, 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 and I had Amy Klobuchar, the senator from Minnesota, as our guest speaker, sitting next to me. 
So Bob gets up to give a speech, and you'll appreciate this, Sheila. I think you might have missed the actual occasion. And he makes a proposal I'd never heard before. He suggests we split Illinois into four different states <laughs> so we'd have eight senators. 20 House members, let's have eight senators. That's what I'm talking about. Bring us all together. So I, this morning I got up staying at the Harris Hotel uh, and Casino in Metropolis and broke even at the casino because I didn't go inside. And <laughs> I woke up at an early hour and I started thinking, what do I remember about this fellow right here? And I jotted down a few things which may, um, a few of you may recognize. Uh, from this man's story. Uh, certainly, many of you will. He was a college dropout who wrote 22 books and hundreds of weekly newspaper columns. When he ran for president, someone wrote that Paul Simon had written more books than Ronald Reagan had read. <laughs> he was the son of a Missouri Synod Lutheran minister who married an Irish Catholic lawyer and attached a Jew Jewish mezuzah to the doorway of his home. He once scandalized his staff by slipping and saying the word damn, but his usual curse words were by George. He wore a bow tie despite re repeat pleas to ditch it and may have owned the world's largest collection of bad taste bow ties donated by friends. And Sheila gave him all away after he passed so that all of his friends had a Paul Simon bow tie. His notion of casual was a white dress shirt with the collar unbuttoned. His idea of a family vacation was to pack Gene and Sheila and Martin into an old Chevy sedan and drive to Alaska or deep into Mexico. When he wrote a book, he would slip away with boxes of material for a secluded week armed only with reams of typing paper and a manual typewriter. I never saw him drink a beer or hard liquor, but he would drink a glass of wine. He did think nothing of driving the highways of southern Illinois in the middle of the night to find a closed gas station with a soda machine outside where he could buy a cold bottle of Pepsi. Friends would send him articles, which he shared, singing the praises of Pepsi-Cola as a great elixir. He couldn't stand Coca-Cola. He gloried in visiting the smallest towns in Illinois to speak to a lady supper in the basement of a Methodist church. But as his scheduler, I had to keep a giant, floor-to-ceiling size state map with red pens in it to warn him not to open his talk at that supper with the same well-worn chicken joke which he had used at the town's lion club just the year before. He really had no other joke. He d and if you ask me later, I'll tell you the chicken joke. He owned a dozen weekly newspapers or more, believed in regular purchases of a handful of blue chip stocks, disclosed his income and net worth each year in painful detail, and being the son of a Lutheran minister was tighter than the bark on a tree when it came to paying his staff. <laughs> he kind of played the piano, but his taste in popular music was non-existent, to the point where I came up with a brilliant idea that Paul Simon go over to the Paul Simon concert in St. Louis. He demurred. He was at a guest DJ with a rock and roll station in Chicago for reasons I cannot explain. <laughs> and when the DJ asked him his favorite musical group, he did say Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops. <laughs> he was deluged with offers to teach when he retired from the Senate, but decided to come to SIU in Carbondale to bring the issues of the day to his students and to inspire them to consider public service in their own lives. For exercise, he got to swim in a pond next to his home in McCandon. He mentored and inspired scores of candidates, including a young lawyer from East St. Louis who lost three straight elections before he finally won one. And his last political act, two days before he died in surgery, was to endorse Barack Obama for a United States Senator from his hospital room in Springfield. He was a visionary. 
He saw connections that a lot of people missed. More importantly, Paul saw answers to problems before most people even saw the problem. In 1998, he wrote a book called Tapped Out, The Coming World Crisis in Water and What We Can Do About It. It was not a New York Times bestseller, and it was Paul's greatest last campaign. Shortly after Yitzhak Rabin was elected Israel's prime minister in 1992, he visited the United States and met with members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, one of whom was Paul Simon. Paul asked Prime Minister Rabin about Israel's and the region's water needs. Rabin's eyes lit up and he said, if we solve every other problem in the Middle East but did, do not satisfactorily resolve the water problem, our region will explode. Peace will not be possible, he said. Paul understood each country has its own unique, complicated, and sometimes intractable problems and challenges. The same was true nearly 20 years ago when he alerted us of this looming crisis, and it's true today. Take the nation of Jordan, for example. Paul Simon saw that Jordan's, quote, growing population is consuming more water, putting greater demand on already water-starved agriculture. Fast forward today. Nothing's really changed. If anything, it's gotten worse. We're in the midst of the worst refugee crisis in the history of the world. With millions of people around the region of the Middle East forcibly displaced, many because of the devastating drought in Syria from 2006 to 2010. And while Syria's civil war rages on, more Syrian families continue to seek safety in neighboring countries. Jordan houses nearly one and a half million Syrian refugees, the second largest number per capita, placing an extraordinary amount of stress on an already depleted water supply system. But there is a glimmer of hope. Historically, Israel has fewer water problems than its neighbors, but its political agreements with neighboring countries are very complex. And as Paul Simon warned, could be catast catastrophic. And tapped out, Paul quoted American journalist Judy Perez, reporting from Jerusalem, and he wrote, the attitudes of Israel, Israelis, fear, and Palestinians, anger and resentment on the issue of water are a stark illustration of why peace talks have proceeded at a snail's pace. The anxiety is worsened by the knowledge that water is scarce all over the region, with poor quality adding to the problem of insufficient quality, quantity. Well, not much has changed. In 2008, Palestinian leadership began claiming that Israel was starving Palestinians of water to break their economy. These claims continued for years. Of course, Israel denied the charges, maintained the causes of the problem were Palestinians breaking pipes and wasting water and tapping pipes and stealing water. As a result, Israel's settlements suffered from lack of new water projects and the Palestinian people suffered even more. Finally, some good news. Earlier this year, Jason Greenblatt, the president's Middle Eastern envoy, announced that the Israelis, Jordanians, and Palestinians will finally cooperate on a large water infrastructure project known as the Red Sea Dead Sea Conveyance. The project helps the shortage of clean, fresh water in the region. But the biggest news out of the deal is not water, it's hope. One tongue-in-cheek editorial in the New York Times called it, quote, a high watermark in Israeli-Palestinian history regarding this precious resource. In the last few months, the Israeli-Palestinian Joint Water Commission started meeting again, and projects are beginning to restart. restart. Let me be clear, I don't expect peace overnight in the Middle East because of this. But when Israelis and Palestinians move toward pragmatic approaches, in this case about water, security and stability are more likely. Paul Simon saw this long before most of us. He understood that water scarcity is not just a humanitarian issue, it's a global security imperative. The Red Sea Dead Sea project is a step in the right direction. For too long, many ignored the issue. Nobody talked about it today because of Paul's vision. Uh, the world is talking about it. But we have a long way to go to solve the water crisis that Paul so deftly warned us about. When Paul Simon wrote Tapped Out, he predicted that in the year 2025, 
three billion people will be living in regions afflicted by severe water shortages. Paul was prophetic, but he was wrong. The World Health Organization tells us it won't be three billion, it will be four billion. That doesn't mean we haven't made progress. It just means there's a lot more to do. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because when I began working on this issue, the United States Congress and our government wasn't express, they weren't expressly funding any water and sanitation projects in developing countries. But you can't say that today. I joined with Congressman Earl Blumenauer of Oregon. We introduced first a bill entitled the Paul Simon Water for the Poor Act. It passed Congress, signed by President Bush, and it made providing access to clean water and sanitation for the world's poor a key priority. In 2014, we had a different version entitled the Paul Simon Water for the World Act, building on Paul's leadership to bring reliable, clean, affordable access to clean water and basic sanitation to tens of millions. You often wonder when you pass measures like this whether anybody notices and whether it makes a difference. And so I went on a trip to Haiti, to Port-au-Prince, and I visited a hospital there known as Jeskio. And it was at a time when they were fighting a cholera epidemic, which was claiming thousands of lives in Haiti. The woman doctor who took me on the tour said, I gotta show you something. And she walked over to a sewer lid and she pointed at the sewer lid and she said, under that sewer lid is a reservoir of clean water that's available for 10,000 people in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, sparing them from this cholera epidemic. And I said, that's great. I said, how much did that cost? And she said, $20,000. I said, well, that's not much. I said, how did you raise the money? She said, we didn't have to raise it. There was something called the Paul Simon Water for the World Fund that ended up paying for it. Paul Simon and I had a mutual hero and a fellow named Paul Douglas. Paul Douglas made it clear, as Paul Simon made it clear, he didn't want a statue after he'd served in Congress. He didn't want some bronze plaque somewhere, although people put those up from time to time. But I thought to myself, what lasting memorial would Paul Simon have wanted? And I think it would be Water for the World Act and things just like that that really address the issues and the values that this man brought to so many of us. I'll close with this. Years ago, Gwendolyn Brooks, Illinois Poet Laureate, and the first African American to receive the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, spoke at the Paul Simon Institute. After her speech, she stuck around, signed books, and spoke with every person in the audience. This created quite a line, but nobody cared. They waited their turn. Inspired by the crowd, one of the students who was heading to gospel choir rehearsal encouraged the entire choir to skip practice and perform for those waiting in line. Everyone was thrilled, but no one more than Paul. Why? I think it's because he watched as his students helped others, and simply helping others was all the legacy Paul Simon ever really wanted. Thanks. I'll be glad to answer a few questions. And Jack, I hope uh, I'm not uh, out of line here, but I think you missed an elected official in the room here, or appointed official, uh, State Representative Natalie Phelps Finney. Is she still here? Oh, she was here earlier, so you didn't miss her, but I had to mention her name anyway, if you don't mind. Proceed. Anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, Senator Durbin, for coming. And I really enjoyed your presentation. I have one question and confirmation. I think I heard you say that one of the things that my neighbor, I live in McCanda, by the way, <laughs> Senator Simon did was to endorse President Obama. And you said he did that when? He did it, he endorsed him for the U.S. Senate. When? Well, it was uh, 2000 and, help me, but, Bill. But just before in his life cycle? Yeah. November of 2003? 
Yeah, but it was just before what happened? Paul passed away. He did it two days before he passed away. Senator Durbin, um, I have been have taught ESL students at Carbondale High School, so the DREAM Act is an issue that's very, very close to my heart because those kids are my kids. And I'm, I know that you and Senator Duckworth support the DREAM Act. Obviously, you wrote the DREAM Act. And about 10 years ago, I had some of my ESL students write letters to you in support of the DREAM Act. Is there anything we can do at this juncture uh, to encourage legislators from other states, as residents of Illinois, um, to, to, to support reinstatement of DACA or something to help these, these kids? Speak to your congressman and make sure that he supports it. I, I don't know if he's taking a public position, but I ask everybody, regardless of your congressman, do that, uh, because the House votes will be very important. In the Senate, we have um, 48 Democrats, I think I can get them all. I hope I can. We need 12 Republicans. I have four. I'm going back next week to sit down in a room with a half dozen others uh, and to try to persuade them to join us uh, in supporting the DREAM Act. Today I met with a half dozen students from SIU Carbondale who are protected by DACA but only for a short time. Uh, and it, it was an emotional meeting. You know, to have a bright, wonderful young woman student here break down in tears in front of me saying I don't know whether I should continue going to school it sounds like I may face deportation that's the reality of what we're discussing she came here at the age of two she grew up in America in Chicago pledged allegiance to the only flag she's ever known can only sing one national anthem and all she's asking for is just a chance to earn her way into legal status and to become part of you know this uh, nation's future. She could lose it. She could definitely lose it because March 5th on 2018, DACA protection ends. What President Obama created ends. And we have to be there. So it's my highest priority. You're welcome. I got a question. Good evening, uh, I'm Jennifer Shostak Frey, and I am a licensed substance abuse counselor and a probation officer. And uh, I used to work at the Wells Center in Jacksonville, which is now closed. The opioid epidemic is hitting the small areas. I'm, I live in Pike County, Illinois, is hitting the small areas in all of Illinois. And to have treatment centers close is absolutely not going to work for the people who are dying. Um, Narcan was just used on one of my clients and brought her back to life after she overdosed and she didn't remember doing that. So I think there was some federal money that was available to for projects for opioid addiction and I'm wondering if Illinois is planning on receiving any of those. I, I don't know about the state's application. There is federal money available, not nearly enough, not even close to enough. If I would have asked this audience, 15, 20 years ago, the following question. Someone died from a heroin overdose last night. Where do you think that happened? Is it inner city? Man or woman? Man. Race, African American. Age, probably over the age of 30. And they would have been right. That was the demographic of heroin overdose deaths, deaths 15 or 20 years ago. Now, ask the question. And the answer is, it could be anybody, anywhere, any color, either gender. It could happen. There's no town too small, no suburb too wealthy. It can happen anywhere. And our nation is being inundated by this opioid heroin crisis, heroin fentanyl crisis. And we go to try to figure out how do we get there. Well, let me tell you the starting point. The starting point is a pharmaceutical industry in the United States which produces 14 billion opioid pills a year, enough 
for a one-month prescription for every adult in America. Fourteen billion. Now, who approves the number that they produce? The Drug Enforcement Administration of the United States of America. The agency we've empowered to stop the abuse of drugs and to slow down the addictions approves the production of 14 billion pills a year. These are not for export. This is for domestic consumption, dramatically more than we can ever need. Last year, because of pressure put on by a number of senators, myself included, I'll add, uh, they finally reduced the quota requested by pharma. Then how do the 14 billion pills get into the circulation? Primarily because of prescriptions that are written. And we've reached a point now where the Center for Disease Control has put out guidelines to doctors across the United States saying, wake up. If you give, let's assume you have an ankle injury, and let's assume you have a surgery, and let's assume that you are given seven days of opioid pills. If you take opioid pills seven days, the studies show 8% of those people will be taking them a year later. That's the nature of this addiction. And when the addiction for opioid pills gets beyond a person, they go to the cheap alternative, heroin. The cheap alternative, which is often laced with fentanyl, which is deadly. That is the reality of what we face across America. States like West Virginia and New Hampshire, I mean, as bad as it is in our state, they are twice, three times as bad in terms of the deaths that are going on. So what do we do about it? If there's any good news to come out of this, and there isn't much, but if there's any good news to come out of it, we are starting to speak about addiction in different terms. Not that many years ago, addiction was a moral failing. Today, addiction is known as a disease to be treated. That is a giant leap in thinking about how to deal with drugs and addiction. And we're starting to have people respond in that fashion in terms of uh, substance abuse treatment and whether criminal incarceration is the right answer. We don't have nearly enough sources for substance abuse treatment, not nearly enough. And we have some ludicrous rules in Washington that says no facility of substance abuse treatment can have more than, is it 16 patients on Medicaid staying overnight? 16. Go to the Haymarket House in downtown Chicago and tell me that 16 Medicaid beds, that's all you need for downtown Chicago, right? Are you crazy? Of course not. I mean, so the rules don't catch up with them. The resources don't catch up with them either. So there's a number of things that we have to do. Thank you for your work in this area. It is, it is truly heartbreaking to meet a family who's lost a beautiful young child who they didn't even know was addicted uh, to this kind of uh, problem. Doctor? Oh, you got, yes, sir. Just gentleman first. Yes. My name is Elias Reed. Uh, Sunday's Southern Old Newspaper listed U.S. Congressman John Lewis is saying the government must help rebuild k uh, That means HUD providing replacement housing in the city. The government should live, lend a helping hand to rebuild the housing because they participated in the destruction of the housing. Uh, do you think John Lewis would be able to help get new housing built in Cairo? I think John Lewis is right. I was in Cairo again today, and I've made several visits down there. The people who live in this public housing, Cairo did nothing wrong. The people who managed the Alexander County Housing Authority did something terribly wrong. Uh, and uh, there's an investigation underway, as there should be. Now, these people are living in, in housing that should not be part of America, period. We need to do better by them and their families. And when I went to the, the Caro School today and met with the sixth graders, they're looking around at one another, and they actually asked the question of the principal, is this school going to be here next year? And it's an honest, legitimate question. If 180 families pick up and leave, which may happen if this housing project's torn down and not replaced, uh, then what happens to the school district? What happens to the students that remain? I mean, th these are real challenges. I agree with John Lewis. Uh, I haven't been able to convince Dr. Carson at HUD, but I'm going to continue to, that there are alternatives that we ought to consider for housing and care, uh, humane alternatives, affordable alternatives, that give these people a chance to stay if they wish.
Yes, uh, I'm Ben Begley. We met earlier. Um, my question is about the uh, uh, in the in the Senate and the Congress, uh, the role of bipartisanship. I'm sure you've been there long enough to have seen some deterioration in that. Is there any hope for the future? Or are we getting more divided? No, I think there is hope, and I think there's more hope in the Senate than most places. The Dream Act. My co-sponsor, Lindsey Graham, Republican of South Carolina. Criminal justice reform, my co-sponsor, Chuck Grassley, Republican of Iowa. Medical research uh, to increase funding 5% a year. Co-sponsors, Lamar Alexander and Roy Blunt, Patty Murray. There's a lot of bipartisanship going on there. On the biggest issues of the time, health care, the Affordable Care Act, for example, uh, they tried to do it just strictly with one party, and it didn't work but it only failed by one vote. So we're likely to see it again. What's the solution? Sit down both parties and work out ways to make this healthcare system work better. We can do it, I'll acknowledge. I think it was one of the most important things I ever voted for, but it's not perfect. It's time for us to address the run up in premiums in the individual marketplace. The fact that there's nothing built into uh, our approach to healthcare that deals with prescription drug prices. Can I say a word about prescription drug prices for a minute? There are only two countries in the world that allow pharmaceutical companies to advertise on television. The United States and New Zealand. Why do they advertise on television? So that you will go to the doctor and ask for that drug. That's it, that's what it boils down to. How about the warnings they give us on television? You ever listen to those? I love those warnings. If you're allergic to Cosentix, don't take Cosentix. Well, how would I know? But my favorite one says, and be sure to tell the doctor if you've had a liver transplant. <laughs> Senator Durbin, that incision on your chest, you haven't mentioned anything about it. Oh, the liver transplant. They're running up the demand for expensive big name drugs and running up costs. Blue Cross Blue Shield in Illinois now pays more each year for pharmaceuticals than they do for inpatient hospital care. We're reaching a point, my friends, where there has to come, this has to come to some reasonable conclusion. Yes, they make a, should make a profit. Yes, they ought to have money to invest in research. But when they're spending billions of dollars a year, five billion on media, 20, another 15 billion in persuading doctors to push their product, that isn't money that's going into research. Uh, that's money that's going into pushing the market into uh, untenable positions. There's plenty of room for bipartisanship even on that one. I hope there will be. Now, Senator Durbin, since we're on a university campus, uh, kind of a two-pronged question. Uh, first and foremost, uh, is there anything that can be done about the exorbitant, outrageous cost of textbooks for college students? I look at some of these dealing with my kids who are now through, but now grandchildren going through, and I see loose leaf books, if you want to call them that, for a couple hundred dollars. And secondly, is there anything, can we, are we making any progress on these young people that are being stuck now with unbelievable amounts of money owed on their, they borrowed to go to the college they get out, and, and it's tough for them to buy a house, buy a car. I mean, they're just overburdened with this. Thank you. I did not plant this question, <laughs> but I'm sure glad you asked it. I started asking the same question about five years ago about textbooks uh, because of a couple experiences I had uh, talking to students at universities, and uh, it was an eye-opener to me. In the last five years, the cost of textbooks have gone up 90%. Now, come on. There may be some specialized textbooks, and I get it, that are teaching things that are on cutting edge, science or computers or whatever. I get it. But 90%? And so we started asking a few questions. We found out that most professors don't know the cost of the textbooks that they require for their courses. How about that for a starter? Shouldn't the students have a disclosure when they sign up, I don't know if they go through what registration like we did, probably not, it's all online, I'm sure, but there ought to be a disclosure about what textbooks cost. So students know that when they're going in. 
Secondly, we found that when they were putting new pocket parts on textbooks, uh, that they were making the students buy a brand new textbook with it. The pocket part is the update. That should be enough. Uh, and we found a number of other things that are troubling uh, in terms of these textbooks. I actually visited a public university in our state where a professor was teaching Spanish first year, Spanish. She had what you just described, the loose leaf with the little plastic binding was her textbook. It turns out that Spanish was such an evolving language, she required that they buy a new textbook every year that they not use last year's textbook. And she asked questions to make sure they did. Now that's crazy, that's plain wrong. So we started moving uh, in more disclosure. Uh, I remember going up to one private university near Chicago, I'm not disclosing names to protect the innocent, but uh, there was a young woman who was in a course in economics. And she told the story about how when she went to the bookstore to buy the textbook for the course, it was a paperback book that cost $125. It was written by a man named Mankiw. I happen to remember that. So she went online and found out that she could order it overseas and get it a week or two later shipped to her for a fraction of the cost. When she said that, a woman in the audience held up her hand. She said, wait a minute, I'm your professor. How much did that cost? She didn't know. The professor did not know. So here's what we're moving toward. It's only happened once. We are trying to fund sustainable textbooks. The first uh, grant that we've given is the University of Illinois. They have one on environmental sustainability uh, that can be amended by professors, but it's online, and it doesn't cost students anything. It's available to them. Now, that doesn't work for every course all the time. But when I think of what I paid for textbooks, even in my day, back in the old days, uh, it is just intolerable, uh, unacceptable. I think schools can do better. And I hope that this is one of them that is doing better. Uh, when it comes to student debt, it is a backbreaker. Uh, these young people end up with more debt than is imaginable uh, in many instances. What's the way to avoid it? Well, first, stay away from for-profit colleges. That, to me, is the biggest ripoff in American higher education. 9% of the students, 17% 17 of the federal aid to education, 40% of the student loan defaults. Students in for-profit schools like uh, Kaplan, and, uh, which is now going over to Purdue, uh, or DeVry, or uh, University of Phoenix. So stay away from those. Secondly, students are finding that first two years of community college may be a way to cut the cost, the overall cost. And I talked to Randy today about the cooperative effort with community colleges to bring the students after two years into the main campus here and move them to a valuable baccalaureate degree at SIU. But we can do an awful lot more in, in trying to find ways to reduce costs and still give students a good fighting chance. You can't imagine, incidentally, most people know this, but it's worth saying, student loan debt, aside from taxes, is the only non-dischargeable debt on earth. You default on your mortgage, you can discharge it in bankruptcy. You default on your car loan, discharge it in bankruptcy. You can't do that with a student loan. You take it with you to the grave. And if your parents signed on with you, they're in for the ride too. So it's, it is just something that I think has gotten completely out of hand. One more question. Here we go. My name is Cindy Vines. I'm a retired educator. And I am also a grateful citizen. And I want to thank you and Senator Duckworth for your steadfastness during these trying times. I know things are difficult where you are, and uh, I'm very grateful, and I don't always send a message telling you so. I'm also concerned about uh, the country's future and the propensity that I'm looking at uh, of going to war in some of the um, some of the rhetoric that I'm hearing. Can you give us any assurance that this will be something that is thoughtfully debated? And is there anything we can do as citizens to uh, encourage diplomacy? Our Constitution speaks with some clarity to this issue, but in terms that don't apply today. Our Constitution gives to the American people through Congress the authority to declare a war. 
The Constitution gives to the President of the United States as Commander-in-Chief the authority to execute a war. After Franklin Roosevelt gave his Day of Infamy speech, we went for decades without presidents asking for authority to go to war. We fought war in, in Korea and Vietnam with scant uh, approval by uh, the congressional uh, leaders. Uh, since then, we've had some votes uh, on this issue, and I will tell you, as a member of the House and the Senate, there's not an issue that keeps me awake more than the thought that tomorrow I'm voting on a war. I know people will die, and it just won't be bad people. people. There'll be good people dying if there's a war. Uh, even well executed, there'll be good people dying. Uh, but even that has gotten complicated. After 9-11, we had votes on two wars. The first war was the invasion of Iraq, weapons of mass destruction. 23 of us voted no, one Republican and 22 Democrats. And I thought, still do, think that that was the right vote. Then, shortly thereafter, there was a vote on going to war with Afghanistan. And the argument there was, this is where the terrorists are based. This is where Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda are based. They are the ones who killed 3,000 innocent Americans. And we've got to let it be known, you don't do that to America without paying a price. So I voted for that war. I still think it was the right vote then. But I didn't know, and I don't think anyone who voted for it knew we were voting for the longest war in the history of the United States. It still goes on today with no end in sight. So getting to your basic question about the authority of this president, he does have the ability, if not the authority, to start a war. I hope that he would turn to some of the people I voted to have around him, General Kelly, uh, General Mattis, and others, before he would make such an ominous decision. A war with North Korea today, hundreds of thousands of people will die in a very short period of time. Seoul, Korea is 35 miles from the demilitarized zone uh, with North Korea. They have had artillery in place for decades, preparing to devastate Seoul, Korea if a war ever starts. That is the reality. The other side of the reality, the leader of North Korea is a madman. He's starving his people in a police state to build nuclear weapons. Uh, that is what we're up against. So it certainly is uh, evidence that we not only live in a dangerous world, but we've got to be careful of dangerous rhetoric. This is a time when our leaders, all of our leaders, including the president, should be thoughtful about the words they use and choose because there's someone on the other side listening and the message they take away may not be that this is fun and games and a reality TV show. It may be that an attack is imminent and they may sadly initiate it on their own. I worry about it. Do we have the authority or ability to stop the president? No when it comes to this decision. Uh, that is the power of the president in this circumstance. I wish I could end on a higher note. <laughs> I will tell you one thing. I went to uh, Nashville, Tennessee uh, last week on a little political trip uh, for my party, and I went to the um, Grand Old Opry. Anybody here ever been to the Grand Old Opry? And there was a fellow there named Bobby Bear, a country and western singer, and uh, Bobby's been around a while. And he got up there and he said, um, did you notice I'm wearing hearing aids? And people said, yes, yes. And he says, I'm wearing them because of a conversation I had with my wife. It was our anniversary. And she said, I'm proud of you. And I said, and I'm tired of you too. <laughs> That's when I decided to get hearing aids. Thanks, everybody.